Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad Wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'da habita fillah We reached in the book of marriage Chapter 1 The chapter of equality in marriage and right of choice and in this chapter <clears throat> uh, the hadith or a hadith are a reference to the concept in the sharia of people being evenly paired in marriage and in Arabic, the term kafu means to be similar or resembling or to be a peer of, to be someone's peer. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ And there is nothing or no one that resembles him, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have a peer. Kufuan ahad. There is there is no one that resembles or is like Allah Azza wa Jal, nor is he like anything of his creation or his creatures. So similarity or equality in four things. So this kafu is talking about people should be or preferably should be similar in one of four things or equal or similar in religion of course in lineage profession and freedom these are all things that the scholars of fiqh have looked upon uh, when talking about this concept of kafu uh, in marriage and among these four religion is agreed upon and regarding the others it is disputed and very important for us to at least have an idea about these concepts uh, and those things supported by evidence that is sound evidence we accept those things which are not supported by sound evidence then we cannot accept that as a part of our deen, if it goes against the nasus especially, and goes against the broader Islamic concepts. So this is talking about kafu in marriage. And kafu or kifa'a <coughs> is, uh, as Sheikh Ben Uthaymin mentions, he mentions three uh, types of kafu. Kafa'a fi din. So this is talking about in the the in the religion having the same religion or similar. Well, the same religion here is the concept. Uh, and then he mentioned, and that is divided into two types. So having the same religion is divided actually into two types. He said one is ikhtilaf a din, meaning religion. The religions are the, are, are uh, different, different faiths. For example, kufr and iman, Islam and Christianity, for example. And then he said the other type is the difference in adala. <coughs> adala refers to the just uh, the the way in which someone is trustworthy or that they are uh, they're, uh, they're just or their trust their trustworthiness and what is meant here meaning the difference between fisk and a meaning disobedience and obedience so as an example, the asl 
is that the origin of of kafa'a fi deen, when it's the same, you're referring to a Muslim marrying a Muslim. Okay, a Muslim man marrying a Muslim woman. And then fitting the other type, that is, for example, what else is allowed is a Muslim man marrying a woman from Ahl Kitab, a Kitabiyya. So that has to do with the Kafa'a Fideen. They are different in religion. However, we have a text, which of course is the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that the Muslim man can marry the woman from Ahl Kitab. A just Christian woman, you know, one who's not an adulteress and what have you, or a just, just and, and, and um, uh, righteous uh, Jewish woman. That this is permissible for the Muslim man to marry, and this is because of the Nasus, because of the Quran. So that lets us know that it's either that asl of uh, of a Muslim man marrying a Muslim woman, and of course they're the same. Kifa, kifa, uh, uh, kifa'a is the same. They're the religion is the same. Or a Muslim man marrying a Christian or Jewish woman that is uh, just, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. <coughs> And it is agreed upon that a Muslima cannot marry uh, a non-Muslim man. And this comes also in a nas, in a text, in, in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al-kareem, فَإِنْ عَلَّمْتُمُوهُنَّ مُؤْمِنَاتِ فَلَا تَرْجِعُهُنَّ إِلَى الْكُفَّارِ لا هن حل لهم ولا هم يحلون لهن. In سورة المنتهدة منتهنة verse uh, ten, Allah subhanahu wa taala says, and if you uh, and if they know, uh, you know that the the Muslim women they cannot, if they are known to be Muslim women, they cannot return to. The, the disbelieving men. They are not uh, uh, lawful for them and likewise they, meaning the men, are not lawful for them, the, meaning the women. So this shows us the kafa'a fi deen and where it's ikhtilaf, where there's difference. So the Muslim woman is only allowed to marry a Muslim man and the as we mentioned the Kitabiya a Mu'min he can marry a non-Muslim woman meaning from Ahl Kitab meaning the Jews and the Christians and, and with the condition that the Quran is laid out however some of the scholars they mention that there's a couple of things that need to be noted in this situation the regarding the the seriousness and the potential danger so one of the reasons why some of the scholars they dislike this and it, it also depends upon the situation is that the when a Muslim man marries a Christian or a Jewish woman and then he has a lot of love for her Okay, because it's your wife, it's your spouse. And some are some people are overcome by love. So if they are overcome by love, it's possible that this can affect his religion and have him compromise his religion or even leave his religion. So that's one situation. The second situation, uh, or dangerous situation, is that if he marries uh, a woman from Ahli Kitab, then that means, of course, he is not marrying from a Muslim. You know, uh, unless, of course, he marries more than one. And even in that situation, it means one less Muslim has the opportunity for marriage in this case. So these are two situations in which it can be uh, where it is uh, that shows why it would be disliked under certain circumstances to 
uh, to marry from another faith. And that relates to the kifa'a in the deen. Then there is also the situation, as we mentioned, uh, a kifa'a fi adala, as we mentioned, regarding being similar in righteousness, so to speak. For example, a man that is known for zina, and we already mentioned this in the prior uh, a hadith about marrying, you know, a fasic man, a man who's known for zina or known for wickedness, marrying a righteous woman, then their kifa'a is not the same. So in this situation, you can see the harm in that and that he can bring her to disobedience to Allah and to wickedness and to even leaving her faith. Likewise, the other way around that the man a righteous man marrying a wicked woman she can just cause him stress and harm in his religion harm to his uh, his wealth and property and if they have children even children that she may not rear the children in a righteous way so there's a lot of harm when there's not kifa'a under certain circumstances and that and and especially with regards to religion and righteousness to have righteousness as far as the lineage then in tribal societies but also you'll find in other societies you find that they may emphasize these things such as being similar uh, you know from the same tribe okay and we see a lot where there's a lot of harm in that and sometimes if the people just just because they know the families and stuff where there can sometimes be good, but when you restrict it totally, say only from such and such tribe, as if someone else, the other tribes are beneath you, this kind of thing, then this arrogance, this can be displeasing to Allah. Well, I shuck it is displeasing to Allah when it's done out of arrogance and so forth. So this is also a type of kifa'a that the fuqaha, the scholar, they've spoken about, and even some have spoken about Arabs and non-Arabs, or Arabs and former non-Arab slaves. And so this is why another type of kifa'a that was mentioned is with regards to uh, where we mentioned freedom, in that someone who, of course, a person who is not a slave is not going to ma marry a slave, more than likely, okay? They, that, they, so that the kifa'a is not the same. Likewise, even someone marrying a freed slave. Okay, so this is one of the things that they speak about. However, Allah knows best about any evidence to support that, any sound evidence, and that uh, this could amount to, uh, no doubt, a type of discrimination. So if it is a negative attribute, then we don't attribute that to Islam. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. So with regards to the first hadith in this chapter narrated, uh, this is the 855th hadith narrated Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the Arabs are equal to one another and the Mawali are equal to one another except a weaver or a cupper reported by Al-Hakam but there is a nameless narrator uh, there's a nameless uh, narrator uh, in its chain of narrators Abu Hatim graded it Munkar meaning that is a rejected hadith it has a supporting narration reported by Al-Bazar from Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala an with a munqati' uh, broken chain. So this shows that this hadith is not to be relied on but the fuqaha have uh, spoken about these issues and from other uh, ahadith and other evidences have spoken about the general issues of what we mentioned. And in the next hadith uh, narrated Fatima <clears throat> uh, 
radiallahu ta'ala anha, daughter of Qais, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told her, marry Usama, reported by a Muslim. And in this hadith, this shows, and this is in Sahih Muslim, the opposite hukum. And that is that in this hadith, in this hadith we see that um, <clears throat> that Fatima, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, told her to marry Usama, and Usama, his father had been a slave. His father was a former slave, so. That shows us there wasn't uh, this kifa'a as far as marrying a or a descendant of a former slave or what have you, even though they were not equally yoked or equally um, uh, compatible or considered in status in that society. However, that did not have an effect because the Prophet wasallam ordered her to marry him, said marry him. So that, that lets us know that that was not, uh, that Islam, the bond of religion, is much stronger than the people's concepts of what is, um, of what is considered as far as status and as, fitter, and, and as far as people thinking, uh, uh, you know, that they're better than others and even the concept of kafa'a should be in relation to those matters of deen and and so forth especially it can be if people are of two different statuses that can also that that can also be considered it doesn't mean it's an obligation or anything but it can be considered if you for example a poor man wearing marrying from a very wealthy woman this can be an effect on her family meaning her family could have their own prejudices and their own issues, which is their problem. But at the same time, they could cause her harm and harming her marriage. They have children and then they force them to divorce from so much pressure or what have you. Or when there's different tribal situations, uh, there are differences in the tribes and the people put that emphasis, then perhaps in those situations, you want to consider those things because we know countless cases, even in the West, of people from Somalis, from Pakistanis, and others who tend to be tribal people and in, in, in certain societies, definitely Somalis are, and in certain regions of Pakistanis and probably those who are less educated or what have you, they emphasize the tribal ties more than maybe someone of, of status, perhaps. And sometimes it's status. And the main point is, is that because of this, these, this, inequality and kafa'a, you know, that they are not uh, the same in their status dunyawi, worldly status, as in some view certain tribes in a certain way, and some view others because they're not wealthy in a certain way, that this can also actually have real repercussions on the marriage because of the problems that the people make due to this. And then also, a last point with that, is also because of those inequalities that you can also, the inequality in wealth, a woman could be used to a certain standard of living. And then she marries a man who doesn't, who's re restricted in his livelihood. And she has certain expectations of a certain type of lifestyle that she came from and she expects, and he is unable to give her that. This can also be a, a cause for problems in the marriage. So this is one of the reasons to consider the kafa'a, especially if that is going to, if you see that especially, that's going to be a problem in the marriage related to the families, related to uh, the issues of the individuals uh, trying to marry. Some of the benefits of this hadith is this hadith uh, shows us
this hadith shows us that it is important to uh, to consult one another prior to marriage about uh, shortcomings of one another, of the spouse or uh, of the spouses. Meaning that if uh, the woman has some ailments or the man has some ailments or something similar to this or as far as their... Um, if they don't know much about the status of one another, then that should be also mentioned prior that, hey, I'm not from a wealthy family, I don't come, you know, I'm not wealthy and I expect that we're going to live like such and such. You know, these things should be ironed out before the marriage, and this is one of the things, this hadith, uh, that the scholars uh, deduce from this hadith. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the guidance he gave his companions and that he had khibra, he had experience uh, and was able to, from his experience and his wisdom, to be able to show he was a leader, that he was the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the Imam, he was... Uh, looking and caring for all the affairs of his ummah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this hadith also shows that the permissibility of someone being uh, a freed slave marrying someone who is, who, is, who is not a slave, who is never a slave so this also shows the permissibility of that for those people who have uh, a concept that this is uh, impermissible. And this hadith illustrates for us this. And prior to more contemporary times, of course, most of the history uh, since the time of the Prophet Sallallahu slavery has existed all throughout the world in different types in the Western, in the Western world, in various types of slavery, especially the trans transatlantic slave trade from, from Africa to the Caribbean, uh, the UK, uh, in Europe and, and to America that and to the Americas as they say so this this uh, this was one type of slave trade that was horrendous likewise the Arabs also uh, and other and Africans as well and uh, pretty much most uh, societies had some form of slavery although there may have been some differences in the social mobility and and maybe some of the brutality of some of the slave systems but most of the world has uh, if not all practiced slavery at some time or another and probably uh, and up until more contemporary times uh, even in the Muslim world and with that being the case then this ruling would have been more had more validity or more uh, relevancy to those time periods. Another benefit of this uh, hadith is this hadith shows us that Islam places importance on manners in deen, not on what people view as the status in these worldly things. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu was Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentioned the importance of taqwa and that being the thing that distinguishes us. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also mentioned the importance of the heart in taqwa. And the Prophet Sallallahu also mentioned in the Sahih Hadith that in the Laha La in the Laha La Yandrukum Wala illa Surakum Walakin Yandrulu Kulubukum wa Malakum that verily Allah does not look to your your shape and your uh, the way you look, but rather he looks to your heart uh, and your deeds. So this is very important for us, uh, and those are some of the main benefits of this hadith. And in the next hadith, the 857th hadith, narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, O sons of Bayada, marry to Abu Hind, someone of your women and marry from his women, his daughters, even though he was a cupper. 
Abu Dawood and Al Hakam reported it with a Hassan uh, good chain of narrators. So this hadith illustrates for us, and that's why it's in the chapter of equality in marriage and khayar. Uh, here it is re in reference to the kitha'a or the equality the uh, of marriage and letting us know the Prophet Sallallahu gave this particular advice and it shows that even though the people of uh, that Hind's family uh, was from the cuppers it said Abu Hind someone of your women and married from his women even though he was a cupper so even though one of the families was uh, you know the, the profession of that person in the family was that they were a cupper so this lets us know that the other family from this hadith was probably not a cover sh cupper showing us that in this Hassan hadith that there the kifa'a as far as the trade or uh, life there was no problem with that there was no problem even though they didn't have the same professions or their families maybe had differing status so this shows us again illustrating for us that uh, the that the profession and those things are not of great substance and in fact have little substance unless it is something that's going to really truly affect the marriage in that related to marital expectations or if the families are going to cause problems or something like that but Islam ho does not hold that as something that that is important that the wealthy person must wear, marry a wealthy person a cupper must marry from a cupping person or this tribe must wear, marry from this tribe so those uh, are not of real substance in Islam. And we learn that. That's one of the benefits of this hadith. In the next hadith, the 858 hadith narrated Aisha radiallahu anha, Barira was given her choice regarding her husband to remain with him or separate when she was freed. Agreed upon. It is a part of a long hadith. <coughs> Uh, in this had uh, in Muslim has from Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, anha, her husband was a slave. Another narration from her has he was a free man. The first narration is more well established. It has been authentically reported from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma by Al Bukhari that he was a slave. And so, uh, from this hadith. One of the benefits, again, this hadith shows the importance of uh, of khayar, of having a choice with regards to the with regards to the uh, the marital bond. That when there is some inequality there, for example, Barir, I believe, was was freed. So she became freed, she had the choice. She could either, because she was married as a slave, so she could either be with, remain with her husband, she had that choice, or, uh, you know, she could be separated from him. So as far as the uh, maintaining her marriage. So it says, uh, but it was given her choice regarding her husband to remain with him or separate when she was free. So this uh, uh, hadith illustrates for us the biggest benefit of this hadith is it shows us the right of choice in marriage when status changes. When status changes. And this is the also showing us the kitha'a, that there was a difference in uh, her status change. So this now was a change in the kitha'a, in the in the uh, the equality or the the status the, the status there the social status which was serious from being a slave to becoming free a serious uh, transition there uh, in the next hadith narrated at the hak at the hak uh, ibn Fairuz adelimi uh, on the authority of his father, radiallahu ta'ala'in, 
I said, O oh Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have accepted Islam and I'm married to two sisters. Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then said, Divorce whichever of them you wish. Reported by Ahmed and Al Arba, except Al Nisa'i ibn Hiban, Al Darqutni, and Al Bayhaqi graded it as Sahih authentic, but Al Bukhari considered it defective. In this hadith, uh, this hadith illustrates for us also the point of uh, khayar in that uh, of having a choice, and this was in the situation where the husband just had a new status, he became Muslim. He left disbelief to come to Iman. So he became Muslim, and in his custom of Jahiliyyah, they were able to marry. He had married two sisters. But in Islam, that is not uh, recognized. So he was given the choice to choose one to divorce. So this also illustrates for us in this situation the kifa'a or the uh, uh, the khayar to, to have that choice uh, in when these kind of situations happen when one uh, leaves disbelief to come to Islam this hadith also illustrates for us another important uh, benefit and that is that the marital contract of disbelievers is generally honored in Islam. It is honored in Islam unless the situation that when they become Muslim, it then has uh, goes against clear Sharia principles. For example, uh, in this example of the Hadith, that. Uh, the man, he became Muslim. He had two wives that were sisters. And this was from his, pre, his, his Jahiliya custom. He, he became Muslim. So he still, Islam was recognizing his marriage. But the Prophet ﷺ gave him a choice to choose one to be married with or choose one to divorce, basically. Because Islam does not recognize marrying two sisters that's invalid in Islam so because that was now something that was against the Sharia that Islam gave him the choice to choose one to marry so that's that's why that whole that Islam kept the general marriage intact but he had to uh, divorce one because that was that aspect was in contradiction to the Sharia Likewise, there are many other situations similar to this. Uh, there, there's other scenarios, but this is just important for us to understand this. Uh, that that scenario in general that that's the most important thing for us to understand uh, as a faida from this uh, hadith in the 860th hadith narrated Salam on the authority of his father Ghailan ibn Salama uh, Ghailan ibn Salama accepted Islam and he had ten wives who accepted Islam along with him so the Prophet ﷺ commanded him to choose for them, reported by Ahmed and Al-Tirmidhi. Ibn Hiban and Al-Hakam graded it Sahih or authentic, but Al-Bukhari, Abu Zur'a, and Abu Hatim graded it defective. In this hadith, the hadith of Ghailan uh, <coughs> ibn Salama, Uh, in this hadith, we find some of the benefits of this hadith. Is that uh, 
if there is a a marital contract that is Uh, if, if it is facet that and it was completed in the time of disbelief then it is not ruled as facet or nullified after Islam meaning that as we mentioned prior to this in the other hadith that although Islam doesn't recognize that you marry ten women for example that the the marriages in and of itself are not nullified except what negates them is that when the person becomes Muslim that now they have uh, they have ten marriages which is not recognized in Islam so then the in this hadith, the person was given khayar, was given the choice, and to keep four, and the rest uh, had to their nikah was uh, became Ill, uh, illegitimate, became nullified, which is a bit different than talaq. Meaning talaq would mean there would be an idda, there would be all these things, but it's mentioned that there. Nikah was facet at that point that it was nullified after he chose the four so this hadith shows us this important principle that Islam does not necessarily negate the asal of a marriage that took place in the time of Jahiliya or you know prior to Islam but it, we have to look at what the soundness of that marriage within the context of Islam after a person has become a Muslim you know, is it permissible to have that type of relationship? For example, the woman who becomes uh, a Muslim and she was married, she was a Christian, she becomes Muslim and her husband is still a, a Christian. So then now that she's entered Islam, then there is a, a time period uh, and according to what a lot of the fuqaha mention is, or some of the fuqaha mention, that it's her idda. You know, that her idda would be counted and then, uh, you know, if he hasn't become Muslim then, then their, their nikah would be uh, facet. Another benefit of this hadith is that is that the after the marriage, I mean, after the, the, the person becoming Muslim, that once the thing which prohibits their their marriage from being uh, the the prohibitor to recognizing their marriage is removed, then their nikah the marriage uh, stays in place. For example, in that example in that hadith, that what negated or what was not recognized was the ten marriages. Ten marriages is not recognized in Islam. You can only, for a man, he can only marry up to four women. So, now that this person has become Muslim and his, he has ten wives, that is the prohibitor of what is considered legitimate in Islam Remo by him having nullified six of those marriages then now those four marriages are considered legitimate so I hope that scenario is that's another way of looking at what we already discussed but that is just from a thick perspective another important benefit of this hadith is that this hadith illustrates for us that it's impermissible in Islam to have more than four wives. Islam only recognizes that a man can have four wives at a time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
فَأَنْكِهُوا مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مَثْنَى وَثُلَثَى وَرُبَاعَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that uh, to marry uh, you know what you can from from women or marry uh, women uh, either uh, you know whatever you're to able to take care of you know the, assuming that responsibility from the women uh, two three or four Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions and then to the rest of the ayah which mentions if you are unable to uh, be just then you should marry only one so this illustrates for us uh, from that ayah which is evidence that it is only we are limited as men to marrying only four women those are just some of the main benefits of that uh, hadith in the next hadith Uh, narrated uh, Ibn Abbas Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa returned his daughter Zainab radiallahu ta'ala to her husband Abu Al-As Ibn Rabi' based upon the first marriage after six years of separation and he did not perform a new marriage reported by Ahmed and Al-Arba except in Nisa'i Ahmed and Al-Hakam graded it as Sahih uh, in the next hadith, because these two hadith that they seem to have uh, uh, contradictory reports, so it's important we read both of them so we can gain a general understanding of what is the benefit of these hadith or, or a benefit of this hadith. Narrated Amr ibn Shu'ayb on his father's authority from his grandfather, the Prophet ﷺ returned his daughter Zainab to her husband Abu Abbas by a new marriage, a tirmidhi said the hadith of Ibn Abbas is better than Amr's hadith in consideration of the chains of narrators. However, that which is being observed in practice is Amr ibn Shu'ayb's hadith. Uh, in this hadith, this hadith illustrates that if, uh, if a woman accepts Islam and her husband remains uh, a non-Muslim, a disbeliever, According to most of the scholars, their marriage is canceled, meaning uh, not divorce, but this is called fisk, uh, uh, fiska nikah, or fes, uh, and fesacha a nikah, that the nikah is now voided. Uh, and uh, the marriage is canceled, and after the completion of idda, so she has an idda uh, period, uh, she will be deemed free from the bond of marriage. The story of Zainab ta'ala, has many explanations and actually marriage is not canceled in such a case but marrying afresh is better. So this is the case because in the second hadith it shows you know it said that the Prophet والسلام, returned his daughter Zainab ta'ala, to her husband Abu uh, As by a new marriage and so this was at, after seven years. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best uh, regarding uh, that hadith. So the subject or the topic of this hadith and the main point we want to obtain from these two hadith uh, this is that if a woman marries, I mean if a woman becomes Muslim, before her husband uh, or that the husband becomes uh, Muslim before the woman uh, this, this is the general uh, topic of the hadith or subject matter and if the woman is the one who becomes uh, Muslim before her husband then uh, then he should wait you know be given some time before the marriage is voided, and then if he if the husband becomes a Muslim during her idda, then she remains his husband. She remains. Uh, she remains the wife of the husband. Uh, and if the idda is uh, finished, and she and he doesn't become Muslim, 
then in this situation, according to most of the scholars, then the nikah, uh, their marriage becomes voided. And then she finishes her idda. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, knows best. You know, but if the husband, of course, becomes Muslim during that time, then uh, during the idda at least, then uh, the marriage is uh, the marriage would would they would have a continue to have a sound marriage. Their marriage would be valid, and those are just some of the benefits. As we mentioned, there are various views regarding this hadith because the other hadith illustrates for us the second hadith illustrates that the Prophet Sallallahu returned his daughter Zainab to her husband and this is after uh, after seven years so this is uh, you know and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows best the gem or the best understanding of this hadith but we just wanted to talk about the main subject matter of this hadith and in that regard, we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.